Okay, I am here with Olivia Bioni. Olivia, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Raf. I am really looking forward to uh, chatting with you. Thanks for having yeah, me, me on. Too. So, um, in case people have been under a rock, um, who are who are you? <laughs> uh, so, my name is Olivia Bioni. I'm a Pilates teacher and a yoga teacher occasionally. Uh, I am based in Chicago, Illinois, in the United States. I wear a few hats. I am a Pilates teacher. I do mostly private sessions. I am a trainer at Breathe Education. I am a podcaster also, which is like a fun thing that I will get to chat about a bit here. Um, but yeah, that's that's the main game. I teach movement and uh, kick ass and take names. I get to curse because it's your podcast. I never curse you on do. my podcast. <laughs> you curse all you like. Um, so yeah, really, I I wanted to talk to you today. Uh, I mean, I think this is. I hope this is going to end up just being a fairly wide ranging conversation. Um, so you know, different to you know most of our episodes, we're not here to solve any particular problems for the world or teach someone how to you know, the seven steps to solve back pain or anything like that. Um, we're just here to, un- I want to understand, because um, I'm really interested in people who are just doing interesting shit in the Pilates world and people who are creating their own thing, um, people who are sort of pushing the industry forwards in various directions or sideways in various directions. Um, and and you're, you're definitely, you know, pushing forwards and you're creating your own thing and you're doing interesting stuff. So, uh, with your podcasts. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you about that because, uh, you know, it's as a listener, you know, I sort of, I guess I've formed certain conclusions about why you do it and, you know, and, and I've got no idea if I'm anywhere near the mark or not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you about the experience, you know, your reasons for doing, starting the podcast, your, your, um, uh, your experience, what you've learned, you've recorded over a hundred episodes now, what you, you know, yeah, basically just the journey, your journey of, and, and what you've taken away. Um, but also, I mean, you've got some other cool stuff going on, which I also want to talk about. Um, uh, so your upcoming book, for example. <laughs> I told uh, him to we, say that to really like light the fire under me because I would have like to Have we got a publication date set yet? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, let's shoot for the end of this year. Will be okay, great. Date. I'll look forward to it. Um, yes, yeah, so I want to talk about that. And, um, yeah, but basically, so, uh, for listeners of Pilates Elephants, uh, can you tell us about your podcasts, please? Sure. So I currently host and produce two podcasts. One is Pilates Teacher's Manual and one is Pilates Student's Manual. And Pilates Teacher's Manual, the original idea behind it was that when you go through teacher training and you get your manual that has all the exercises and the cues and how to teach the exercises, and then you get certified and you go off in the wild and you're like, gee, I wish there was a manual for making your schedule and working with difficult clients and, you know, answering tough questions and, you know, getting in and out of situations and things like that. And there's just so much about teaching Pilates that you don't learn in your teacher training necessarily. And when I moved to Chicago in 2016 and I started as like a full-on yoga teacher and I was like, I cannot make a living as a yoga teacher. And the studio I was teaching yoga at also had a Pilates teacher training. And so I signed up because I saw that people were doing private Pilates. Like, I want to make a living as a Pilates teacher. How do I do that? Um, I did do that. And so I originally started the podcast because I was like, hey, I figured it out. Like, I know what to do. Um, I've accomplished what I wanted, which was to teach Pilates all the time and pay a mortgage. And I was like, yay, Um, I want to share that with others. Um, And then what's kind of funny as I've, you know, done the podcast for uh, over two years now is that (laughs) what I thought I wanted is not what I actually wanted. And uh, just sort of using the podcast a little bit as almost a story time to talk through, you know, where I am and things. It's like a really weird time capsule now because it's like, hey, what is a Pilates teacher if it's the middle of the pandemic and they're not teaching Pilates? (laughs) And so um, because the podcast started in February of 2020. 
and then uh, we shut down a huh. month later. And yeah, I was so like, that oh. was, yeah, because we shut down in Australia in March. So that was just pre-pandemic. For oh you. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we launched on like uh, Valentine's Day, and so I got to kind of experience that in real time. And I did start a second podcast, Pilates Students Manual, because I realized that my first audience was the people in my classes. And they were like, I love you and I want to hang out with you, but I'm also not a Pilates teacher. So your podcast is weird. Um, So I decided because I was not working for like six months that, you know, I could also do a manual that was like everything that you wish you could have asked your Pilates teacher about like how to do teaser but all we did was that exercise for like three minutes and then you just like go home and stew about teaser. That's what I did. And so I was like, hey, I would love to have tips and tricks and sort of share the theories behind what your Pilates teacher is doing so that you can go and do your workout and be like, this was great. But then if you wanted to learn a little bit more about the why and the how and, you know, what are the Pilates principles and uh, you know, what if I'm a runner, just kind of all those like what if situations um, that I could pull back the curtain a little bit for Pilates students as well. Hmm. So um, yeah, one thing that I think uh, for our Australian listeners, when you talk about that, I mean, maybe it's obvious from what you said, but uh, something that eluded me for a while is uh, in the US, when you say Pilates students, you mean like class participants, people who yeah. pay money to take a Pilates class with you. In my mind, and I think probably most Australians, that translates to like an, a trainee instructor. Oh, um, well. So I thought like, oh, you've got a podcast for people who are still doing their training and for people who have just got <laughs> <laughs> It was, um, it was really designed to be for, you know, the students who were in my classes who would ask like really great questions. And like, I wish that I could tell everyone in that class, mm, like, mm. hey, you know, this is um, you know, why your leg clicks in one leg circle or whatever. Um, you know, I want to share that. So I guess there's a lot of overlap, I would say in listenership that there are a lot of people who listen to students who also listen to teachers, but the idea was like from a student perspective, if you had had in-person private sessions and then there was a pandemic and then you had virtual private sessions and you want to do in person again, things your Pilates teacher might be thinking about when you're scheduling that or pricing changes or whatever. Um, So more of a, I'm taking classes and I want to know why my Pilates teacher makes me do the hundred or something like that. Yeah. So like the, the motivation for you to start the, I guess both podcasts was really quite kind of, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this word quick, Quixotic or chaotic? Like, is it <laughs> anyway? Like, uh, quite selfless um, or altruistic um, is the word I can pronounce. Um, <laughs> in that, you basically you wanted to give, you know, to pay it forward to people. You know, things that you wished you knew when you graduated from your certification that you just had to figure out the hard way um, that you wanted to sort of share some of those hacks and shortcuts with other people who came after. Yeah. I felt that, um, especially, I mean, it became more apparent in, uh, quarantine and when everything was shut down, how necessary, like how necessary connections are between, um, other people. And I also kind of saw from teaching Pilates as well, that it was a bit of a lonely profession that you could go into the studio we, there was a joke in my studio that like you never see two Pilates teachers in the same room because if one person they're is teaching all the same classes, person. yeah, <laughs> well, if one person teaching classes, like the other person's not there because the studio is full. Um, so, kind of fostering a little bit of a mentorship moment, but just a community as well that was really, I wanted it to be very supportive, very encouraging. Um, that stu- that. Students, teachers, Pilates enthusiasts were really welcome to come and ask questions. And there wasn't any, um, like, I very rarely talk about choreography on the podcast because it's like everything except for the exercises. Because I don't care if you cue the hundred with tiny little arm beats or with gigantic arm beats. Um, I care that you've created a schedule that you can, like, eat dinner during dinner time. That would be ideal. (laughs) I'm definitely a gigantic arm beats guy, but, you know, I think live and let live. 
Right. But there's there are times and there are conversations that have happened that regardless of the, what the question was, because the person's like, well, you don't teach it like me. So you don't teach Pilates at all. You're wrong. Uh, so I'm not even going to engage with you. So it's like, wrong. that's, yeah. that's garbage. Yeah. Let's not do that. Um, and so it was actually funny about the gigantic arm beats because um, I was playing around on the foam roller and doing arm beats and gigantic arm beats are very difficult if you're lying on a foam roller. And I had a person who'd listened to the podcast. I had talked to her about different types of reformers and different pros and cons there. And she was like, you know, I didn't learn the arm beats that way. Can you tell me why you did it that way? And there wasn't an attack. And it was like a totally general like, hey, this is how Joe did it in Return to Life. So that's what yeah. I was demonstrating in this exercise and really opening a line of communication instead of people like tiptoeing around or feeling that you can't approach and ask questions or anything like that. It's so great, and I'm really excited. Uh, that's one of the things I love about your podcast. It's one of the things I try and foster on my social media, and I'm seeing it a lot actually recently on social media, is people asking questions in a spirit of genuine curiosity rather than kind of try and trap you into telling, saying the wrong answer or <laughs> something like right. that. Um, yeah, I think it's great. I think there's a real uh, – there's a real. I think there's a shift in the Pilates world. I remember when Chloe and I started – Played as elephants a couple of years back, uh, you know. There, this, and maybe it, I've just my bubble has changed or something. I don't know, but you know, there seemed to me to be a lot more kind of technique shaming and oh, you're classical, therefore that's bad, or you're contemporary, therefore that's bad. Um, whereas you know, I'm sure that still goes on, but I, at least I'm less aware of it, and I see a lot more of people just sharing and being curious and respectful of it, of differences. Um, so yeah, good on you for contributing to that. And I, I think your podcast is definitely a force for good in the world, you know, in, re in regard to that. So um, just to give us a, just to give us a, um, a, I don't know, a frame of reference, like, yeah, how many podcast episodes have you done? So you've been going to a bit over two years now. It's like, a hundred and something weeks. Um, how many episodes have you done? Sort of what's your listenership? Um, do you monetize it? Sure. Um, yeah. Tell so, us about the podcast. Yeah. So the podcast by the numbers, uh, I believe, and I hadn't checked before, but I'm pretty sure that I've got about 90 episodes on teacher's manual and about 60 ish episodes on student's manual. Um, and my listenership is varied. I can say that every inhabited continent does have people who listen. It's less so in South America and, uh, Africa, but predominantly the United States, I think mostly because it's big and I'm here, but not the most listened to, uh, cities are not in the United States. They're actually all in, all in Australia. So like there's <laughs> a great Australian listenership that if I ever do a Pilates teacher's manual on tour, I will definitely hit up Australia because- yeah. You'll be playing um, all the big arenas here. All the big arenas. <laughs> Podcaster with a microphone <laughs> uh, and a reformer. Um, and yeah, and some in Europe and a little bit in Asia. Um, I found that the listenership expanded a bit when I started offering transcripts of the episodes because then you can read the episode uh, in addition to listening to it because I know the languages that I have any familiarity with, I wouldn't be able to listen to 20 minutes of kind of technical talk about anything. Uh, so I think that having the transcript really helped in terms of making it accessible. Um, I have, I did just check, I've broken 80,000 listens cumulatively on teacher's manual and over 50,000 on a uh, student's manual. So that's really awesome, like from the beginning of time. And uh, in terms of monetizing it, I don't run ads on the podcast, but I do use something that's similar to Patreon called Buy Me a Coffee which is very much um, community sponsored. So you, if you go to my Buy Me a Coffee page, you can become a member and do a monthly contribution or you could do a one-time donation. And I do some perks with that. I'll do a shout out in the episode and, and the opportunity to do a one-on-one -on -one chat with me for just 15, 20 minutes uh, monthly, which is for me like one of the rewarding bits because like another reason for starting the podcast is like Pilates teachers love talking about Pilates with mm. other Pilates teachers and 
So getting to connect with teachers, usually who are in their teacher training or maybe just out of teacher training, who, if we can hearken back to the time when that was us, it's like so stressful and so scary. And like testing out is like this huge mountain, like Mount Everest that you've got to climb. And, you know, just any connection at that point, any encouragement at that point is really, really helpful. So to be able to tell people like, you're doing the right stuff. You've got this. I also wrote hundreds of note cards of class programs for like a year. And then I was like, I can't do this. I'm getting carpal tunnel. Um, but it's, it's a stage, like it's a process. You're not behind, you're not failing at life at all. Like it's all part of the journey. Um, the work that you do now is going to pay off dividends, uh, on the other side of this. You will never have to, uh, do a performance teaching adventure ever again. You just have to get through this like big push. Yeah, I think that's so important that uh, normalizing people's experience because I, I think that's one of the key premises behind this podcast as well is that uh, a lot of instructors carry these questions and doubts around and you know are afraid to voice them because they think, oh no, I'm the only idiot that doesn't get this or I'm the only idiot that feels, you know, anxious about this. It's like, no, no, most, most people <laughs> feel anxious about that. That's Everyone. pretty normal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so I think, yeah, um, you know, platforms like, like yours and like this one are really important because we have the opportunity to actually call it out and go, yeah, no, this is normal. You know, what you're experiencing is normal. Yeah. And that's when I, uh, started inviting guests on, which I do sporadically. Um, it, I've, One of had them, that. I've had that yeah. pl pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the most important thing to me, like I wanted them to, you know, share what they're promoting and like what they're working on and their, but really share their story just so that there's mm. lots of stories out there of how people became Pilates teachers, because some people were dancers who did Pilates and then they couldn't dance anymore. And so they became Pilates teachers. Like that is a path a hundred percent. Um, and then there's people like me who are like, I want to make a living. I like teaching movement. I've actually never been on a reformer, but I could probably do a teacher training. Like mm. I've got time. I was teaching like five hours a week of yoga and like trying to pay rent it was not great. So I was like, I could probably do this. And I ended up loving it, which is great. But I wasn't one of those, oh my God, I got on the reformer and it was amazing. I was like, mm. it's going to be amazing because <laughs> this is Because I'll be, be able to pay living. my mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it's like very pragmatic. And I actually felt kind of embarrassed saying that the first time where I was like, I actually wasn't like super in love with Pilates. I didn't know who Joseph Pilates was. Um, I just saw this as like a potential career. It's something I could do in addition to yoga. And now I've shifted uh, almost entirely uh, into the Pilates game. Huh. I love it. So you said earlier that the reasons that you start are not necessarily the reasons that you continue with something. So you started, I thought, I thought I heard you say that, um, you started the podcast really out of this kind of motivation of paying it forward to people. Is that the reason why you've continued? Because 90 episodes, I mean, you've done 150 episodes-ish now total. I mean, that takes a lot of commitment. I know because we record an episode of this every week for the last hundred weeks. It's like, Sometimes it's a freaking slog. You're like, I'd really rather just lie on the couch today and read a book. But, but then, I mean, I always enjoy my conversations with people and the, and the episodes. It's so rewarding hearing, you know, hearing from listeners and, and stuff. I love talking to listeners as well. I Zoom with listeners fairly regularly. So I totally understand why you've, you know, what you get from it, I think, on a, on a, because I've experienced it myself. But I just wonder, like, you know, the reasons you started, are they still the reasons that you continue to do it? I think the more that I connect with uh, people who listen to the podcast and also, you know, talking with people who are in training programs, that I see gaps in my own learning and things like my the way I teach has changed a lot. The things that I prioritize have changed. And so in some ways it's a bit of a uh, documenting my own journey as a teacher because <sighs> that I, you know, I, I thought to be a Pilates teacher, you had to teach 30 hours a week and that had to be the only thing you did. And you had to own 800 pairs of leggings and that's how you be a Pilates teacher. And I did that. 
and it was great. And then I got really burned out and I, it's like actually incredibly awesome that I had a break in 2020 because I wouldn't have not only like, I would not have been hosting the podcast. I would not have been teaching Pilates if I had to continue like through 2020, like a regular year, I would have, uh, just burned myself out. I was burning the candle at both ends. It was not great. Um, so I realized also through these conversations with other teachers, hearing their stories, that there are lots of ways to be a Pilates teacher. There are lots of motivations for teaching Pilates, for doing Pilates. And so continuing to spotlight that so that no one feels like they're doing it wrong if they only teach a Saturday night Pilates class, like you are still a Pilates teacher. If they took three years to test out, amazing, you're still a Pilates teacher. If they... Um, teach Pilates for that 30 hours and are totally invigorated by that. Like you're an, you're a Pilates teacher, you're doing the thing and good for you. Um, so I think that that's part of it. And also, you know, as I learn things, um, I think it's important that the same way when we work with clients and they're like, Oh my gosh, I can never do teaser. I can never do teaser. And then they do teaser. And then it's like the next thing they're like, Oh my God, I can't do that other thing now. And so a bit of it is, you know, reflecting on uh, what's changed, um, like how my relationship to Joseph Pilates work has changed, how my relationship to uh, my clients have changed because, you know, I came out of the gate being very much, I can teach anyone, anything at any time of day or night, uh, all days of the week, like seven days a week, I'm here for you. And that spirit is definitely still there, but now I also go to bed. And that's nice as well. (laughs) And like not commute home (laughs) at nine at night. Um, So it's for me, it's been a a practice of finding a balance in my teaching and then also in podcasting as well. Um, I am like a big routine person. And so now the podcast is like in my workflow. And I know that, you know, it takes this long to plan an episode, record an episode edit the episode. I'm still doing that, but like way less. I talked to you earlier and you were like, what are you doing? Like shortening silences, just like (laughs) let them be, just pack your music on and go. And I was like, no, I have to like take out the ums, which I've gotten much better at. Um, So the editing is definitely shortened down. And then, you know, doing the transcription, the YouTube video, the uh, getting it on the podcasting site. Like I know how long all of that takes and I know where that fits in my week. Um, I don't know. You had asked about it and I was like, I don't, I just do it, Raph. Like it's on the to-do list and I just do mm-hmm. it. <laughs> it's a thing. Um, why do I still do it? It's, it's like also really fun. Uh, it's really, the connection is really fun. And also like the accomplishment that you get that you're like, you know, this is something that I made, that I've done, that I've contributed to this Pilates canon. Um, Maybe I get a Wikipedia page that has a link. Mm-hmm. Like that would be awesome. Uh, That'll be cool. <laughs> but Your just, own Wikipedia like, that page. Kind of thing. Yeah, that that made the Pilates world like a little happier and a little brighter, and made teachers feel like they were on the right track because they are. Mm. Yeah, I I understand. It's satisfying on a number of levels, and also there's just the the inertia of like, well, you just do it every week, so you just do it every week, and um. <laughs> I'm interested to explore a little bit more about how your perspective has shifted uh, on your teaching and, you know, you said the way you see Joseph Pilates um, and, you know, because it's an interesting kind of way to triangulate things because you're kind of reflecting on your own journey at the same time as sharing that with other people at the same time as reflecting on other people's journeys. Um, So there's this interesting um, swirl of, you know, I guess perspective from perspective taking there. So yeah, how, how has your, how have your attitudes or beliefs or practices, um, shifted over that time? Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I thought once upon a time, it like seems weird now thinking about it, um, that, Uh, I don't want to sound like dismissive, but I felt like Pilates was like a really big deal and like really huge. And like, if you do anything wrong in a session, a person's going to be like 
paralyzed, which was like not mm-hmm. a well thought out thought, but mm-hmm. um, a lot of perfectionism, a lot of uh, pushing myself in ways that were not healthy in terms of like upholding boundaries with clients in terms of like them contacting you when you're not teaching or like over non-emergency things. And I had this like idea that like I had to be a perfect teacher and that like being a perfect teacher was like one flavor and that Joseph Pilates, I don't think I ever thought Joseph Pilates was like Jesus, but I def and I still respect him as a person, but there was a huge, like, especially going into teacher training without having a lot of Pilates experience. Like I thought that like, this was it, like, this is how you do everything. And there's no variation. It's just like this. And you do it like this. And then you're a Pilates teacher. And then you share that with other people and like box checked. Uh, Um, My guess is a lot of people have that experience. That was my experience because you tend to go into the teacher training of the people who, whose classes you attended. Yeah. Who taught you. Right. So you get this kind of bubble effect. So I think people, I think a lot of us in the Pilates world have that same experience. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're totally right. And uh, when I went through the certification at Breathe, like I would be taking notes and during like a tutorial or something and be like, how does no one have any questions about this? Like, this is mind blowing. It's like when we were talking about motor learning and that giving choices is going to help people learn better or um, setting the bar low and layering up exercises so that people succeed early and, you know, external queuing and everyone's just like nodding along. And I was like, you guys, this is huge. Like, this is huge. Um, and I have questions about it. And I think that some of the questions that you have comes from seeing, like experiencing people from other perspectives. So if yeah. I had stayed at the same studio and taught the same people the same way, I wouldn't have that. I would continue thinking like, well, headrest down when we bridge. Yeah. And it's very important. Like you'll fail your test out if you don't tell people to put their headrest down when they bridge. Um, And so I think I, part of it, you know, through working at different places, through working with different people who had different goals and different experiences with Pilates, that my uh, relationship with Pilates as a movement system kind of expanded and became a bit more fluid and it became more of an exploration of movement and a collaboration with your client instead of trying to fit my clients into the Pilates box. I made a box that had Pilates in it that my client could play in. And that's had such positive like impact on the relationships I have with clients. And I know now that this is part of building a therapeutic alliance and gaining trust of your clients and trusting them and working together. Um, and And I also kind of share that, like, I don't like everything that Joe does, like, and I don't like his order for exercises. I think it's silly that there's long box one and two. Like, you should do all the long box at the same time. Get it together. (laughs) And why did you name both exercises tendon stretch? Right. They're very different (laughs) exercises. One's lying supine on the carriage and one's the freaking arm. Reverse pike on the foot bar. Yeah. also, have you ever seen a swan, Joe? Because they don't look like <laughs> That's that. That's not what they look like, yeah. <laughs> so to be able to take Joe's work and appreciate the movements and the sequence, but also be able to laugh at them a little bit and be like, yeah, swan Joe's way is A, not the way I learned how to do swan, and B, awful for a lot of people, and that's okay. Like we can change things and we can respect the tradition. We can understand where it came from. We can borrow from it heavily as we all do. Um, but it doesn't have to be like law and it doesn't have to yeah. like, it doesn't like, I just, I have, you know, I work with a lot of older clients who have a lot of stuff going on in their body and their body does not do all of the things that Joe thought we were going to like overhead, not on the table. Jack Knight yeah. is not on the table for my 80 year old clients and that's okay. Um, there's other ways to explore shapes and do things. And I think becoming more comfortable with that, becoming more confident in myself as an instructor and not feeling the need to uh, justify myself constantly to myself, to my clients, um, 
or things like I've, I've talked about on the podcast, um, like finding silence when you're teaching, giving your clients space to move without micromanaging them is, has been a huge change for me that I thought it to be a Pilates teacher, you have to talk all the time and you don't, <laughs> you can just hang out and you see so much more when you're not talking constantly and when you're not doing the exercise for them uh, mentally, when they get to figure it out and really learn the movement for themselves. Um, like our clients are awesome and they trust us and they hang out with us every week and they do Pilates with us and uh, kind of letting them shine using Pilates as like a vehicle for them to be strong and capable and confident and just like take that into their lives. Like I have a client who he's 85 years old and he's loves long stretch series on the reformer thinks it's the coolest thing in the world. And he, he tells me like, Oh, I was out with my, with my wife and you know, we met her sister-in-law who we hadn't seen for a while. And she said, Oh my gosh, you look so strong and you're standing so tall. Like I didn't even recognize you. And like, it's just those little feel good moments that uh, you know that the work you're doing has like a positive impact because you see people stand taller, like people's posture change when like it changes when they think that they're cool and they are cool. And so you just get to like hold up a mirror to their own uh, coolness. All of those uh, changes that you described, uh, you know, I think I collectively label as gaining maturity and wisdom like you you became less perfectionist you let go of a lot of shoulds um you set boundaries you you know, took joy in the moment and in you know connection with other humans you know so to what extent did that then you know, a ripple out into other parts of your life, or was that actually just a reflection of a growth process that you were going through outside of Pilates as well? I mean, it it may have been. I know that, uh, as you see in the podcast, but also just in my life, I'm like a cannonball into the deep end kind of person. And so, like when I started teaching Pilates, I taught something like three thousand hours of Pilates classes in three years. Like I was doing it. I was like hardcore doing it. And, um, so I think that I don't know if I'd recommend that, uh, necessarily to everyone, but it did allow me to like experiment in like very rapid time. Like if this was a virus that was replicating, it was replicating very quickly. So I could, um, if I was teaching like six classes in a row, which I was at one point, um, I could try something in the first class. <laughs> if it worked, I could do it in the next five. And like, you can just like workshop, um, kind of immediately. Um, I, so, those, so that three years was like 12 years in Pilates years. It was like 12 years in Pilates <laughs> years. I swear. I look back and I'm like, how did I do that? I couldn't do that again. I don't know what that was, but at the time I was younger and I had a lot of energy and I, and I was really enjoying it. Like, even though I'm teaching less Pilates now in terms of actual movement classes, and I've really focused more of a clinical setting, which in the United States, we just call private sessions. They don't necessarily have a like, clinical name attached to them. Um, but so I've kind of found out like trial by fire, um, which is, you know, stuff that I wanted to share on the podcast that teaching group classes and teaching one on one classes are a very different energy exchange. And for me, I love song and dance. I uh, was a theater person and did my theater thing. Um, probably not surprising to listeners, but I was Hamlet in a gender reversed Hamlet in high school, <laughs> mostly because they didn't think anyone else could remember all the lines. Um, so I definitely have that flair for the dramatic. And so I love the song and dance of group. And I sing, I sing in my tutorials now at Breathe. Um, I enjoy that, but it doesn't recharge me the same way working one-on-one -on -one does. Yeah. And so 
the podcast is great because it's like you're talking to one person. And I think that when you're listening to a podcast, it's like they're talking with you and you're sitting with friends and you're drinking coffee and they're sharing some experience that they've had. So it has that a little bit more intimate uh, exchange once you get over like hearing your own voice, which is a hump to get over, but uh, ends up being all right. Uh, do you listen? Do you listen to your to your own episodes? I mean, I guess you edit them and stuff, don't you? So you have I do to edit to them. them. Right. Uh, I take out sound bites, but now I mostly work from the transcription. So I use a cool transcription software called Descript, which has its flaws, uh, but you, is you nice. You can just edit edit the text, and it changes the. You audio. edit the text, it yeah. changes the audio. Yeah. Um, and you can take out filler words and stuff, but I've decided not to do that because it also sounds more natural to have people not have fully formed sentences because when you're talking with a friend, you don't read an right. essay, you just share. Right. Um, so I do listen to myself talk a bit. And when I record classes and things, um, it's actually one of the most valuable teaching tools that I recommend to people. I'm like, record yourself teaching because you can never remember what you said or what you did or what the outcome was in the moment. Um, but when you play it back, you can watch as long as you watch uh, compassionately and not with uh, a judgmental face, but really from a place of wanting to grow. So I do listen uh, to my voice a bit and it doesn't appall me the way that it did. So I think it's a win. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, yeah, I listen, I, I mean, I listen to Pilates Elephants, but I go through phases where it's like, I really struggle to, to bear listening to it. Like, <laughs> um, but I, I, I pretty much listen to them all because I just think like you, that's, that it's in, in it's an invaluable part of the feedback loop of learn, you know, to learn and to get better at my craft is I have to listen and then observe like, oh, when I interjected then that kind of interrupted the person's flow or, you know, whatever, you know, oh, I should have asked this other question here. That was a, that would have been a better choice or, you know, so, so those kinds of things I think are invaluable. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's a bit painful to me. Just, I don't know why, but it's like, yeah, I, I, I definitely, I listened to myself more when I was first starting and that's where I found, and I will give you this as a podcast tip. A lot of us, when we're talking and we're not confident, we end every sentence like this and then everything you say ends yeah. like that. And it's just not great to listen to it. So the first few episodes where I listened and I was like asking myself questions, even though I was relating a story that is <laughs> straight up census. And I was like, did I? And I was like, please stop doing that. So you catch those things uh, pretty quickly. And I think you also get more comfortable the same way when you first started teaching and you were like mad nervous. Um, it was actually kind of fun preparing to be on this podcast where I was like, ooh, a little tingle of nerves because it usually I just sit down, I've got my notepad and I just, I just go. And so it's kind of fun to, um, be the guest. Like usually I get to do what you're doing, which is smiling, nodding and laughing, which is like a really fun part of yeah, having guests on a podcast. Easy job, yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, that's interesting about your preparation because I, I don't really prepare for <sighs> <laughs> well, you're a genius, so like no, it's already in your noggin. I don't mean I don't mean uh, to say that in any kind of boastful way. It's like I've never been a preparer for anything in my life. Like I'm just a shoot from the hip kind of a person. So. Bless you. I bet you have a lot of like free space in your brain. I'm like a super planner. I have like 365 planners to like put all my stuff in. Um, I've planned less. I used to write out a script and then paraphrase the script when I was recording the episode, but now it's more bullet points and I trust myself enough to be able to elaborate on a given topic. Huh. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I guess my, um, and you know, different strokes for different folks and there's, there are I think there are people who I highly respect who do it both ways, and you're one of them. But um, I think uh, for me, like that, I think it comes from my background in muse as a musician. That 
you know, the music that I always loved to listen to was mostly music that was much kind of sloppy and spontaneous, like the Rolling Stones, Nirvana, Louis Armstrong, you know, stuff that was kind of like rough around the edges. Um, and I, I love that kind of spontaneous quality. Like there's so many albums that I know, like amazing live bands that I've seen that when they release an album, it was like not anywhere near as good as hearing them live. It was too perfect, too quantized, too clean, you know, and it just didn't have the oomph or something that they, they had live. And I, so I, I have always enjoyed that kind of slightly messy aesthetic and I always felt like when I was recording as a musician that it was like the third time you played a song was often the best you ever played it you know by the time you played it 400 times it was like too rehearsed mm. um sometimes so you know so that's I, that's not a value judgment I don't I mean I I love you know some things that are obviously very choreographed. Like I love watching choreographed dance. You know, I would much prefer to watch that than just watch like five people rolling around randomly. You know, <laughs> on a stage. But, I get that. Um, and and I also enjoy you know like a lot of a lot of stuff that is choreographed. So I don't think it's a better or worse way, but I just think for me, I know like I also know like when I record lectures and things, I always feel I present way better when I have a live audience, you know, live, live students there rather than just recording it just to a screen, you know? So I feel like the energy I get from having somebody else to bounce off and keeping it somewhat spontaneous really helps me to, to play a better game. I think that I came to that realization as well, because there's just so much stuff that comes up when you have space for a thought to happen. If you're really busy reading a script um, or, you know, I had had friends on uh, Pilates teacher's manual who, you know, I told them the questions and the topics that I wanted to chat with them about. And then they like prepared answers for it. And it just, it, the answers themselves are like spot on, but the delivery is so yeah. like dispassionate because you yeah. don't get to feel what you're saying because you're busy saying it. And so when you have this, I just learned that the best conversations that I had with teachers is when it became a conversation. And maybe we went on a tangent and we yeah. talked about something that we didn't talk about, but because there was space for that to happen, um, like so many gold moments come out of that when people can share themselves in a way that is true to them and not what they think. Yeah. So tell me about what's, what's exciting you now. In fact, you know, sorry, before we get into that, let's talk about your book. Oh my God. (laughs) So I'm putting this out in the podcast world so that I really, really work on it now. And I think that six months is enough time. I think I can do that. Um, But the idea was, that podcasts are awesome and maybe you don't have 40 hours to listen because my episodes are short. My episodes are like 20 minutes tops. Sometimes you have music is like 22 and then the interviews are longer. So that was a lie, but I wanted them to be short at one point. And you know, that's a long time and I'll have people message. They're like, Oh, I'm working through season two. I just make up seasons because I have a good time with arbitrary uh, times. And so Maybe you don't have 40 hours, but you really want to like get a nugget and you can read the transcript, but that's also like because there's space, sometimes the things that are being shared are not always like the like we could probably get to the point a little faster. Like some of those 20 minute episodes could be five minute episodes if I really like got in there and then got out. Well um, yeah, but uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think I enjoy listening to you and uh, many others. And it's like, well, if you could just give me the three bullet points in an email that I wouldn't read it. You know, I want to hear the, I want to hear the conversation. I want to hear your meanderings, what you did at work this week, you know, what you were thinking in Starbucks when you got your latte, you know, I like that's to me, that's a lot like of the, the human. The, connection. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a lot of the gold. I don't want the three bullet points. Don't, don't shorten them to five minutes, please. Okay. I won't shorten them to five <laughs> minutes. Um, but I, 
would love to take all of the topics because now that I have all of these episodes that are covering like a vast range of things, if I could organize them in a way that you still got a little bit of meandering and still some personality, but you had it in a more organized form instead of having to go, oh, I think there was something about that like season three. And then there was another one in season five that if it was all a little bit more organized, the the goal would that Pilates teacher's manual would actually be like a legit manual that it's like here, happy teacher training and also happy beyond your teacher training. <laughs> you know what? Um, uh, can I give you a little bit of unsolicited advice? <laughs> I love on that? unsolicited advice. <laughs> Well, speaking as someone who's done it, I reckon you could write that book in two weeks. Oh my God, perhaps stop giving me deadlines. <laughs> no, I, I, well, sit down I, honestly, and do it. I, no, I, no, no, not, uh, yes, sit down and do it. But I think there's an easy way to do it. I think you've already done three quarters of the work. So you've got all of these episodes, many of which have transcripts and Presumably, the ones that don't have transcripts, it's very easy to get transcripts. You can just upload them to rev.com or whatever, get a transcript. If you were to then just like like literally get all of the episodes, right, and just list them in a just a, a set of bullet points, right, or numbered list, episode one to 90, right, and then just go through and reshuffle them so all the ones that are the same topic are sort of in a group here and a group here, and then label them as chapters, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter one's about topic A, chapter two's about topic B, whatever. And then, you know, delete out the ones, because presumably you're not going to include all 90 episodes in there, right? So you just go, okay, yeah, yeah delete that, delete that, delete that, and you're left with whatever number, you know. Um, and then uh, just take your script for that episode or the transcript for that episode go through and edit it with an axe, you know, like cut out <laughs> cut out the, the, you know, 90% of the fluff um, and then just literally take what you've got there and read it into rev.com app. That's what I used to write my book. And just, I, I just read it, right? I, I, I spoke it into the app. I didn't type it. And because you can speak like four times the speed that you can type. Um, and you've already got all the content there. Like it's it's not like you'd have to make shit up. It's like it's, no, you've already it's got there. it, right? <laughs> you've just got to org- sort it, right? And then literally read it into the app. The transcript comes back four hours later. You go through it, take out some of the ums and ahs and because no one wants to read your ums and ahs. <laughs> um, <laughs> No. Um, and, 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 you know, add a few bits where you think like, oh yeah, I should have said this or should, you know, like you, when you read it, sometimes you get new perspective on it. Let it sit for a week, go back, look at it, edit it again, bam, send it off to the proofreader, job's done. Okay. To be fair, that is very much what I was going to do because I do have transcripts. I have them for, I went back, uh, the ones that didn't have transcripts, I've gone back and transcripted them. So I have transcripts for everything. Um, and that is the plan. It just hasn't happened. So yes. And I hadn't heard about rev.com. So I'll definitely check that out because uh, that's well, you know, super cool. They're, they're just, uh, they're one or there's Otter. There's, there's a bunch of them, but I think that's a two week job. If that, I mean, like, <laughs> what's your book going to be like five, six hours, you know, total as a, as an audio book. So that's like, you know, two fifty, three hundred 300 pages as a, you know, as a, as a textbook, uh, you know, should take you like five hours to, to dictate it five hour book. You know, so you're very realistic, Raph. I was really enjoying just having like a cloud where it's like maybe a book happens over here with yeah, absolutely you could no do concrete it. plan you to could do it. <laughs> do it. You could do it by the 15th of July. You could, okay. could have it published. We are on the 29th of June now, by the way. We're recording this. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to leave leave that one with you. Okay. Um, and so the book is really it's going to be literally the Pilates teacher's manual, the book. Hmm. The Pilates it's, Teacher's Manual Manual. Because some of the biggest questions that people have had and written in about and asked about are things like choosing your training program, which here's a fun fact. Like I did not shop around for training programs. Yeah. I wasn't like, yeah. which one's the best? It was like, I work here. I don't have to pay to take Pilates classes yeah. here. I'm going to do that. Um, 
So people are now, and especially because trainings are offered online or, you know, people are really prioritizing it. Some people are traveling to trainings and before you travel to Boulder, Colorado, like maybe you want to know what you're getting into. Um, so everything from picking so, your training program. So doing give us the a thing. little, give us a little uh, sneak peek, you know, what's going to be in the picking your training, training program chapter? Um, I think that... I obviously have opinions about the training programs that I think are great. And those are the ones that if people say like, what do you recommend? Like I do have recommendations, but I also recognize that different training programs fit different people at the time they are in their life. Um, Because Colorado may have the best training in the world, but if you can't get to Colorado to do it, it's not the best training for you because I don't think your training program should stop you from being a Pilates teacher. It should inspire you and help you grow into a Pilates teacher. It shouldn't be something holding you back. Um, I know that people's schedules are a huge thing. So if it's a three month intensive somewhere and you can't put your life on pause for three months, like that's not going to be for you. Um, For some people, modules are really difficult. I know from my first training doing 16 hours, 16 to 18 hours in one weekend, and then not seeing anyone for a month and then coming back for another 16 to 18 hour weekend, uh, was difficult for me. Um, not like difficult, difficult, because again, I do everything. I'm like, I'm going to do this. So I ended up doing it and I had a friend who was working with me. So like we did it together, accountability partner wise, But it can be really difficult to hold yourself accountable, especially if you're doing it and you're alone. So, you know, maybe a module works for you. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe looking for a program that can take many years and you're just doing one chunk at a time. Like there's a lot of Pilates teachers who teach Matt who think, oh, well, am am I not a Pilates teacher because I don't know the barrels or the Cadillac or whatever? And it's like, no, you're you're totally a Pilates teacher. Definitely. You're teaching Pilates. The magic is happening. But if you wanted to do it, whether it's financial or you've got a kid or you're pregnant right now or, you know, whatever is happening in your life, um, that maybe doing a module and then having a year off where you can work on stuff, maybe that's a fit for you. So, um, you know, some training programs you have to audition for, and there's this idea that there's like a perfect shape and you have to make that shape to be in the training program. Um, You just want to know that, like, is that something that you value? And when you teach Pilates, are you going to hold people to that standard? Um, And I try really hard not to judge in a way that if you like that, then you're a bad teacher. Because I know that there's a Pilates teacher and a Pilates style for everyone. Um, Just like we've talked about when you were on uh, Pilates Teacher's Manual yourself, like Ashtanga yoga is not everyone's cup of tea. Like power yoga is not um, what everyone wants to do when they do yoga. And that's fine. There's lots of ways to make your dream of being a Pilates teacher a reality. And it's really finding um, teachers who inspire you, teachers who've built you up, teachers who have um, made Pilates make sense in your body and to you, like that's going to be different for everyone. And, you know, it's, there's like more thought that can go into it. And if you know what success looks like to you as a teacher, then choosing a training program makes a lot of sense. But if you're just looking at, and now we have the internet, you can look at training programs in like Switzerland and you're like, how do I know if this is a good one? It's like, well, what do you value? Sometimes it's just having that conversation. Well, There's if I was a sneak in Switzerland, peak. probably run like clockwork and free chocolate every time with every enrollment. I mean, I'm down. I'm yeah. down. <laughs> no offense to any of my Swiss friends. The Swiss maybe. listeners. Yeah. Um, so, so it sounds like that is a, it's really, it's not a list of here are the, you know, top five Pilates training programs or anything. It's like, okay, here are the criteria that you might want to consider depending on your situation. And here's, you know, why these might each of these may or may not be relevant to you. I know it's like this annoying thing that I feel like I do on the podcast a lot where I'm like, what if you already knew the answer to your <laughs> own question? But sometimes like I use the podcast like this a lot. Um, but sometimes you just need a person who is listening to your 
fears and worries and concerns mm-hmm. and thoughts and just like reflecting them back to you and just saying like, hey, like you've already shared like what's important to you. Like let's look for things that that match those criteria and then you're set. Like you've already done the work. That's um, that classic when uh, your friend says to you, oh, I don't know what to do about this thing. I really want to do it and, I, you know, I love it and it's so important to me, but, yeah, I'm just not sure what to do. You know, what do you think I should do? And you're just like, hmm, <laughs> like stroking your beard. <laughs> like <laughs> That's a toughie. Hmm. but it, but it's totally true. And I think we all, um, need that. It's the same way. Like my partner will tell me like, you should do this thing. Like you, like he's actually the person who encouraged me to like do my yoga teacher training, um, where I like went off to India for a bit and did my yoga teacher training and then was like my biggest supporter in Pilates teacher training, like so much of a supporter that they volunteered to be my practice body, <laughs> despite having zero interest in Pilates and um, thinking that it was weird that I had like a teacher voice, you know, like you teach and you're like, yeah, suddenly like commanding the space. He's like, what are you doing? This is strange, but you need 125 teaching hours and I got you. So um, but he'll tell me to do something and I'll be like, I don't know, man. And then like my friend will tell me the same thing. I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. That's exactly what I need. You, sometimes you just need an outside person to, uh, and to, then, to say then the did same you do thing. That, did you do that classic, which I've done many times, uh, of go back to your partner and go, oh, my friend just suggested yeah, I do this thing. Yeah, told you know? me. <laughs> I had never thought of it that way. And he's like <laughs> smashing his head into a wall. Um, but, but it's like that sometimes, like it happens a lot with parents. I look back at, you know, how I've behaved to my parents when I was a teenager and I was like, yikes. Um, they really gave me a lot of great advice that I'm just now starting to like make sense of. Um, I actually, uh, do that quite regularly with Kylie Moniz, who's been on this podcast. Uh, she works at Breathe, as you know, and, uh, multiple times throughout our whatever 15 year association that we've worked together, she's told me something or we should do this or we should stop doing this. So we should put our prices up or down or whatever it is. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then like two years later, I'm like, Kylie, you know what? We should really do this thing. And she's like, oh, fuck <laughs> she that. smacks you, know, you in the face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I'm still, it- still waiting to learn my lesson on that one though. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, all right. So what's exciting you at the moment? Uh, summer in Chicago excites me greatly. Um, Chicago does this really fun thing for people who are not familiar with the Midwest where it is cold for six months and gray and cloudy. And then the sun comes out for a little bit in the summer. So vitamin D makes me really happy being able to go outside and uh, I'm really close to Lake Michigan and just, you know, be by the lake and hear the water. It looks like an ocean. It's like that big. Um, And so I'm highly weather uh, affected. So Mm. I'm loving summer in Chicago, even though I'm an indoor house plant and spend most of my time indoors anyway, but it's still nice to like look out and have there be sun. Um, I'm really excited to Oh, I can say this, um, on the advice of one of your community sessions, I did just put up my prices for the first time in a while and Mm. it was well received. I know. And I was like one of those, like, you should do it. And then like everything in the universe wraps, like, let's do a community session on this. And it's like, let's talk to other teachers who've done this. And I was like, I don't know, but I did. And, um, so that, uh, process that is another one. There's going to be a podcast episode about that because it is kind of nerve wracking and you don't want to mm. like lose clients, but I well, did do that just, process. Yeah. Let's just do a little mini or micro episode on that right now. Um, <laughs> and just like, so what were your, were your sort of anxiety points going into that decision? So I don't have a ton of clients, but I see them regularly. I have about seven regular clients and I didn't want to lose any of them because I liked them. And (laughs) I think it's a little bit different when you're a studio and you are serving lots of types of people and you're constantly getting new people. And, you know, there's some transients with, uh, with studio, like you've got your hardcore few, and then you've got people who are trying out your intro week or trying out your intro package and maybe they sign up, maybe they don't. 
because my marketing budget is zero. And like, technically I am an LLC, but it's not, it's like a studio, but it's like not a studio. It's literally me. And no scheduling software. It's like Google Calendar. And, and is this out of your home? Yeah. So yeah. I do most of it virtually. And then I go to people's homes as well. Mm -hmm. I did more before mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, so it's like micro, micro business, whatever's smaller mm -hmm. than a micro business is me. And I knew that I wanted to make more because I did the thing where I lowered my prices in the pandemic because it's virtual. I know, but I was panicking. And I also have, again, older clients where Zoom was like a hard sell that, you know, doing virtual things was a tough, like learning Zoom was a thing. Uh, so I did that, not thinking of the consequences. If I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have changed it. Um, so I knew like it was already lower than it should have been. And so I, and I wasn't quite at the, like, I'm resenting my clients level, but I was a little bit like, I could probably be making a little <laughs> bit more for like the amount of, like with the value that I'm offering, um, to my clients and how enthusiastically, um, into the Pilates sessions my clients are like, I have a client who tells me that I'm like her Valium twice a week because it's just such a mood boost. And I was like, okay. Um, so I, so I kind of knew that I wanted to do that. And I did the thing where in December I was like, oh, I'll do it in January. And then January I was like, oh, well, it's weird. I'll do it in quarter two. And then it's like, oh, late to July. <laughs> but um, I pulled the trigger on it and I, probably didn't raise them enough because no one left, which is one of the things from the community sessions, which means it could probably go higher. Um, but it's now at a point where I feel like this is like where probably it should have been all along. And Great. now, now I know that I can bump up again in January. Yeah. With no now pushback. all you've got to do is just introduce a regular schedule of, of yearly um, yearly increases. Yeah. And here's another sign that you need to raise your rates. When your clients give you a raise and are just like, this is what I'm paying you now because I don't think I'm paying enough. It's probably a good sign that you mm. should raise your mm. rates. Yeah. When the client, <laughs> when even your clients are uncomfortable with how low your, your prices clients are. are like, I don't like where this is at. Um, so, I, so that was really exciting because that was something that I was really nervous about. Um, but, and then I also look at like who my clients are and I'm not pricing them out in any way. Like they were spending more at the studio before they met me and now they see me and they pay less, but it's fine. Um, I'm in a good place and I will definitely increase, uh, on a, on a schedule so that that feels good. So that's making me excited because the anxiety part of it is gone. Um, I'm going to be teaching a master class for breathe that I am so hyped about wrath. It's going to be OG repertoire on the mat, but with a foam roller. And I love the foam roller, not for foam rolling, because as we know, it's a nervous system trick, not a actually breaking up adhesions in your muscle trick, which is fine. I love a nervous system trick. Like meditation is awesome. And I have been just having a really good time exploring the repertoire with this like laser focus of a foam roller, like how can I make this exercise more supportive, more accessible using the foam roller, like a bolster or block? How can I make this exercise crazy? Have you ever done jackknife with a foam roller between your feet? <laughs> you will now. Like what if <laughs> I had a kettlebell attached to my feet while I did jackknife? And so it's... <laughs> Do you wear a helmet? No. <laughs> You would have to if it was a kettlebell, but playing with the foam roller that I like, I've loved for so long. And it's, it's one of those cool props that has so many like just fun stuff you can do on it. Like, could you lie on the foam roller and roll up to seat it? Like it's a whole mm. new ball game. Mm. It's like a balance beam that moves. Um, so there's a lot of uh, fun balance stuff that you can do. Um, really fun coordination stuff that you can do as well as, you know, adding load, whether you're holding the roller in your hands or you're holding it between your legs um, and just kind of taking repertoire that we know and love and making it funky fresh. And 
I feel like ever not everyone, but a lot of people have a foam roller because there was like a foam roller phase where everyone was like, oh my gosh, I need them. And now I have like five and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do with this? Pilates, of course. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be a neat time that starts in July. And so and that's I'm, a 12 week series, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. we'll build, we're going to build, we're going to start slow. We're going to get spicy. Um. And all right, so well, you got a lot on. You've got your <laughs> you you teach your own. You have your own clients. I do. Your you do two podcasts. I you do. teach for breathe education. You're giving a, a masterclass uh, um, season, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, you're writing a book. <laughs> uh, At and, this rate, it's already written, Raph. <laughs> But what time is it? Um, yeah. Uh, some daylight and left. you're hiking out to Lake Michigan on a regular basis. Yeah. I'm keeping my house plants alive. I've gotten really good at that. Too good at that. I'm running out of flat surfaces. And you might get a kick out of this, but you'll have to get a kick out of it in uh, two to three years. I love cross-stitching which is like if you rendered an image pixel by pixel, but every pixel was an X made of embroidery floss. And I'm doing this really cool torso moment that's like all the muscles of the torso. And it's like, it's going to be huge. It's going to be like big and it's like tiny X's. I think it's like, it's inches. Oh, Australians. So it's like 30 maybe like 24 stitches per 2.54 centimeters. Wow. Um, It's nice. You won't even be able to see that it's X's. So I've been working on that also for two years, but it's like, it's very calming for me, as you can probably tell by my bullet points and my excessive planning that it's like very nice to put like a color X next to another color X repeatedly. So you, uh, well, just my just fleeting thought was it'd be amazing if you got some kind of time-lapse video of you doing that because that, would be truly amazing to see it take shape and to see the 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 the, the fractionation between the minute detail of those cross stitches and then zooming out to see the full. I was picture taking would be pictures of when I started because I usually work for like an hour or two at a time. I was taking a picture of like what it looked like when I started, and then I would do stuff, and then I would take another picture because um, I was trying to like track hours. But it's one of those things where it's like. This is 100% a hobby. You cannot monetize this at all. Yeah. It takes like thousands no. and thousands of hours. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So you have that, um, and I think I have a, I have a, a decent uh, dollop of that as well. Of I, I guess it's like almost OCD-like. You feel calm when you get to do kind of repetitive things that, that you know, tick all the boxes and dot all the I's and cross all the T's. Uh, you know, I understand that. Um, I wonder, like, I'm, it just made me think about, I wonder how you, and you said you have a routine, you know, with the podcast that's in your workflow, you edit at a certain time, you record at a certain time, you write at a certain time. I guess the way I operate is, I mean, I'm sort of a little bit like that. Like I've, I know, you know, generally my most, con, my most creative time is early in the morning. I get up super early. I drink lots of coffee and think and sub- read or watch or listen to something that's going to inspire me and, and educate me. And then I usually read that for about five minutes. I'm like, oh, great. And then I'll, now I'm inspired and I'll go off and do stuff. Um, and then, so then I do stuff, but then like, you know, later in the day, I'm feeling less creative. And so I end up doing more repetitive tasks late in the day that are less creative. Um, but then also like, it just varies from day to day. Sometimes, some days I just don't have the mojo and some days I got twice the mojo I usually have. And <laughs> so to a certain extent, I kind of just go with the flow, but yeah, I just wonder like how you... How you manage your en- your emotional energy and your physical energy and your focus because you're kind of fractionating between, diff- you know, you're, like I said before, you're teaching classes or clients, you're teaching um, instructor trainees, you're podcasting, you know, you're doing a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah, how do you manage your time, your energy? I, I, I'm not really interested in so much time management, but it's like how do you manage your focus and your emotional and physical energy? 
I mean, I still have days where I'm like, I choose sleeping. Thank you. Um, I do a lot of movement on my own. I do a lot of yoga and a lot of Pilates on my own. And that's usually a recharger, even if I wake up. Like the studio where I take yoga classes has an eight hour cancellation window. So I have to decide the night before if I want to take class at 7 30, because I'm definitely not staying up until 11 30 to cancel it. Um, so I kind of know going in that I know that I do better when I make time for myself to move if not every day, five to six times a week, like I need to have some time where, um, and this is another thing I just learned about myself. Like I could do it on my own. I am certified in both movement modalities, but I need someone to tell me what to do. And I just know that about myself. So I know that I either need to get to class or if I'm watching a class on record for like Heath's reformer pack, I've got like an American contingent that we're going to watch the replay and do it together because otherwise it's not going to happen. Um, so I'd say the most energy management comes from like knowing about myself and I look at my week and if I'm covering classes for someone or if I'm, if I know that I've got a lot coming up or there's uh, big meetings or anything that I know I'm going to be there for that I do the things that I need to do, not quite on my schedule, but still in a way that they get done. Um, I've done a wild thing and like given myself a weekend and that's incredibly rejuvenating to like have two days that I'm not teaching that I can go grocery shopping and go for a long walk and um, hang out in pajamas, which I am also a great fan of. And so I do those things, to take care of myself. I do drink a lot of coffee. Coffee is, is great. Um, but I also like, I make, the most of it, I'll get like in a creative -y mood and I'll take a bunch of videos that I'll be able to edit into snippets and take pictures and stills from. Um, and I, when I'm in like a content creation mind, I'll try to do everything until I'm not. So I, I love to stockpile. I don't stockpile as much as I probably could. Like when I started the podcast, I was like, I'll record eight episodes in advance and I'll be set to jet for the whole season. Mm -hmm. And that did not happen, but that's okay. Like I found <laughs> a week ahead workflow that works for me. Um, yeah. I mean, it seems silly, but I think so much of it is just knowing yourself, knowing how you work and know that if you're not in the place that you need to be to do things that hopefully your schedule exists in a way that you can give yourself time to just like binge watch criminal minds on Netflix. Like there's 12 seasons on Netflix right now and I'm halfway through season six and I'm like, I could probably do that in three days. <laughs> so part of it's prioritizing. Um, but like, just like finding a balance, like if what you're doing is making you feel so drained that you can't enjoy doing it, then like maybe don't do as much, which I swear to you, three years ago, I would have punched myself in the face for saying that. And I would have been like, no, you have to do everything. But it's like, I've taken weeks off of the podcast and I do try to take little hiatuses um, every few months or so. And I just give myself a month and I don't think about the podcast at all. <laughs> I just like, um, I just get to relax and do things that are not the podcast. It's, I mean, I don't think I've got it perfect. I think that there's still times where I'm like, Ooh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I've, I've just found a pattern of engagement in the things that I like doing. Like some people might hear like caring for houseplants and cross stitching be like, that sounds tedious and terrible. So like, obviously those aren't your recharging activities, you know? Um, it's like finding what, uh, what fits for you and then, maximizing on. I feel like life is just like a case study in yourself and just finding out what works. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Um, I think the, the two things that you said that really resonated with me there were one, uh, just knowing yourself and by which I'm, I understand you mean, like I know for myself that one of the things that makes the biggest difference to my quality of life and thinking is just not having to rush. So the difference between, scheduling meetings back to back versus scheduling meetings with half hour in between is like night and day for me, you know? Um, so, you know, so things like that, I think just I've learned through trial and error is like, yeah, I can do meetings back to back, but it's like, you're not after the second meeting, you're not going to get my best self. Um, mm. and I'm going to make shitty decisions and probably be rude to people unintentionally. Um, uh, 
And so, and the second thing is, um, yeah, sometimes when you have something scheduled to do at a certain time, like, oh, I'm going to punch out this video or create this lecture or whatever, it's like, and you sit down to do it and you're like, I'm really not feeling this right now. And you could force it and come out with something kind of shitty, <laughs> but it's actually, yeah, I've, I've learned over the years, it's just better, it's better to go away and watch a bit of Netflix or go for a run or whatever. And, and then usually within 24 hours, I'll just be walking around the house going, and I'll be like, oh, I know exactly what to write for that thing now. And bam, it'll come out in five minutes. No, that's, that's so true. And that is exactly, exactly what can happen. And I, I've also found in my constant combating of my own perfectionism that not necessarily to like push through and do shitty things because you feel like you have to do them, but giving yourself the space that doing something is something, you know? So if it's something that I, uh, I'm trying to think like, there's not really anything that I do that I hate that I like drag myself to do, but if I just wasn't in the mood for it, um, especially if it's something that doesn't really matter, like social media doesn't really matter. Um, just giving it a go. And the the last thing I want to say about the podcast as well is something that my partner told me, and it's probably a quote from someone else, but that there's great value in stating the obvious. And the things that were obvious to teachers who've been teaching for 10 years were not obvious to me um, when I was starting teaching. And even though like... I just did an episode about the difference between being an employee and an independent contractor, especially how that relates to taxes, which are going to be different in every country and different in every state. But like, I didn't think about it until I had to think about it. And even if 90% of people are like, I already knew that you have to set aside money for taxes when it doesn't get taken out of your paycheck because you're working as an independent contractor. If 10% of the people didn't know and that saved them a nightmare in like late penalties, I think that that it's worth sharing. So. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's, I, I haven't heard that quote, but it totally rings true. I've, I think of it as uh, the curse of knowledge and I didn't make that up, but it's basically when you know something well, it's almost impossible to imagine what it's like to not know it. And so you just think, well, of course, everybody knows to put aside money. You know, it's like, why wouldn't you know that? You know, it's crazy. But it's like, yeah, a lot of people don't know it. Why not? Because no one's mentioned it to them. <laughs> why would they know it? There's this, I don't, this is going to be very vague, but there's something in ancient Egypt in like the Mesopotamia, Indus River Valley, some ancient civilization. And there's this like very well-documented city and like trading port that had all of these great items and they were like huge in terms of trade. And there's so many references to them and like note keeping and things. And we know everything about this civilization or this town or this port, except for where it is because no one wrote it down because how could you not know where it is? Everyone so it's just like, ways, yeah. it's just buried somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and we don't know where it is because everyone figured that, it's you know, where it is. So <laughs> I think that in like a very small scale, that can be the podcast. Yeah. Well, I think there's there's definitely something in that. And I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of comedians essentially, you know, build their whole career on doing this is stating the obvious, the things that we're all kind of think, but, you know, don't mention because it's kind of taboo or the, the little private experiences that we all have, but don't share with people um, or just the kind of the weird questions that we might have that we th- think like this doesn't really make sense to me but we think oh maybe i'm just stupid everyone else gets it but, <laughs> just keep going but, <laughs> yeah. but yeah so a lot of comedians make a, a whole career out of out of that and i think i've really tried i'm not a comedian but i've really tried to do that with uh pilates elephants i think it's very difficult to 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 find what's hiding in plain sight and to to see those uh, to, to be able to again see those obvious things that you know when you're a beginner at something or if you're relatively new at something you know they seem like a ginormous big 10 foot tall letter of fire you know burning statues but when you're really experienced you're like it, they become totally invisible because they just form part of your your base assumptions about how the world works that it's like it's like going around saying hey everybody 
there's a sun in the sky or something. It's like, it's just <laughs> <Right>. like, <laughs> why would you bother saying it? You know, everybody knows it. I think a lot about the, especially in terms of teaching future teachers, I think a lot in the the quadrants of competence or the regions of competence that you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And then you know what you don't know. And then if you work at it, you can do whatever thing, but there's like some conscious competence, but you have to really think about it. And then eventually as a master or really great in your field, you get to this unconscious competence where it just happens and you it's difficult to work backward to a beginner who is not even <laughs> on the radar of things that that they're learning that right. was not summed up well but no i think i think it's i think it's very important and the the i think it cuts both ways which is like we said that okay when you're expert at something it's really difficult to put yourself back in that beginner's mindset and and see what the challenges and questions and and things that don't make sense you know are for that beginner but also as a beginner you know a lot of times beginners ask the wrong questions you know so they 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 ask you know they want help with things that actually won't achieve the goal that they want to achieve mm-hmm. so it's you know it does cut both ways and sometimes the expert needs it's their job to you know uh, kindly, uh, you know, <laughs> um, help the person understand that they're actually asking the wrong question. And, you know, it's like, I don't know, if you if your car breaks down and you go to the mechanic and say, oh, can you fix this starter motor for me? And the mechanic's like, well, that won't solve your problem because the starter motor's working fine. It's this other thing that's the problem, you know. Mm. It's like, well, you wouldn't want that person to just, you know, fix the starter motor for you. And be <laughs> you like, <want> <laughs> great job, good luck. <laughs> How come my car still doesn't work? Well, you never <laughs> told me you want it to work. <laughs> Right, you just um, told me to fix this thing, right? Right, and I, so I think you know uh, a lot of times. Like I think, I think in terms of uh, what I, where I see this a lot is um, for people in 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 business. People want to know, like, oh, how do I get better at posting on social media? And often, I you know, I think like, well, how do you know that's going to solve the problem? Your problem, like, you know, <laughs> what are you trying to achieve by posting more on social media? Oh, I want to get more clients. Ah. Oh. So maybe the better answer, question would be like, how do I get more clients? Or why do you want to get more clients? Oh, well, I don't have enough money. Huh. Well, do you have any clients? Yeah, I've got like 20 clients. Oh, are you working as much as you want to work? Yes, I am. Oh, well, maybe you don't need even need more clients. Maybe what you need to do is put your prices up, you know? <laughs> so, so yeah, often the question that people ask is not the best question. And if you just answer the question, often that doesn't solve the problem they want to solve. And I think in rehab, uh, and anatomy, you know, I see it a lot as well. Like people come in often in anatomy training, what they want to know is like, oh, how do I target the XYZ muscle? And then the question is like, well, why would you want to do that? You know, and oh, well, I want to help the person have a better posture. Or why do you want to do that? Oh, so they can get rid of their back pain. It's like, oh, so there the better question would be, yeah, how do we help this person get past their back pain? Um, and maybe targeting the muscle or improving their posture is not the most effective way. Maybe there are other things that you could do that will have more leverage to help that person. And so, yeah, often the beginner asks the wrong question. But also, like we said at the start, often the expert doesn't give the answer that the beginner needs because the beginner is missing key basic assumptions about how the world works. That you know, so that would be the equivalent would be if if the beginner came and said, oh, like, I've, uh, you know, how do I target X, Y, Z muscle? And the expert, that's the wrong question, to fix my back pain. And the expert said, oh, you know, just go to bed earlier, you know, <laughs> which actually- Very mismatched. Te- yeah, <laughs> which actually is like technically probably likely to help somebody who has pain if if sleep is an issue for them, mm-hmm. but is not going to wash with somebody who- is not even thinking, it doesn't have even the frame of reference to understand that sleep is an important factor in, you know, in pain becoming chronic. So it's like, well, yeah, both of those people are kind of talking past each other. And I think that's a real skill. I think as a beginner, it's a real skill when you're asking an expert to rather than ask them a specific question about how do I do X, to ask them, okay, I want to achieve this goal. What's the best way, you know, from where I am right now, what, what would you recommend I do? You know, 
um, rather than asking them like, you know, fix the starter mode. You just go, okay, well, my car's not running at the moment. You know, what do you think's the best thing to, <laughs> to get it running? Right. I've got back pain at the moment. What do you think's the best thing to help my back pain? I want to learn about business. I want to make more money. What do you think's the best thing, you know, to make more money? Yeah. So I, th- I think there's a question, there's a question asking skill as well as a, um, putting yourself in the shoes of a, of a beginner skill. For both people, the beginner and the expert, it's really easy to um, become so laser focused on, you know, your perspective and what you know to be true based on your experience and all the stuff that you've done that um, both sides don't really entertain other options potentially because the expert has it figured out and the beginner is really sure that it's this one thing. And, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a mind opening experience for everyone that you want to just be available for brilliance to like pop in in whatever form, because sometimes it's the little quote on your tea bag and sometimes it's a podcast you're listening to. Um, Sometimes it's a conversation you're having with another teacher and just like not feeling so locked down or making a mistake that I did thinking that I had it totally figured out and this is how you do it. Um, That's a way to do it. That is an option. (laughs) That is not, not the only way. Um, And yeah, and I love, I love listening to your podcast because you've got so many teachers that are sharing, you know, their way, what worked for them, how they solved problems for themselves. And that's, it's like all the cool people and you get to hear their, their solution and their, it obviously worked for them. Like they're awesome. And you just get to benefit from it. It's like living all these lifetimes concurrently and you get to see what happens if you do this or what happens if you go this way. And that's pretty incredible. Yeah, I, um, that really uh, excites me as well. I think that um, just to finish that off, and maybe um, we're coming almost to the end of the conversation, but I think the the middle ground there that you're describing is is somewhere between, you know, there is only one true way, and you know, all unbelievers must be punished. To, you know, at the other extreme, it's like, well, fucking anything works. So who gives a shit? doesn't matter what you do, you know, and somewhere in between there is like, okay, there are probably some ways that work better than other ways, but you know, there are probably several ways that you could achieve any given goal and none of them is intrinsically better. And you can get to choose whichever one appeals to you most or is most accessible to you or whatever. But I think the key thing is to pick a way and do it rather than hopping, you know, from one to the other or getting overwhelmed and not starting. Um, yeah, to pick a way and and execute on it and follow through with it, uh, and and make adjustments as required, as you you know getting as based on what works and what doesn't. Adjustments um, as required is definitely yeah. the thing, and that's yeah. how I found transcripts, and that's how I started posting episodes on YouTube, and that's how I started running a buy me a coffee page where I could connect with people. As I found what was exciting me about what I was doing. And the question became, well, how can I do more of that? And how can I uh, do less audio editing, which is not a great source of joy and more hanging out with cool people and (laughs) talking about cool stuff because that is exciting. And my solution is just don't edit the audio. (laughs) (laughs) That is a solution. (laughs) It's cheap, cheaper as well. It's cheaper. Um, this has been uh, a lot of fun, Olivia, and I've learned some. Actually, I've learned some cool t- tricks. Um, what, some of that stuff about uh, what you said at the start about transcripts. Um, we don't do that, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. It's pretty awesome. It's mm. pretty sweet. Thanks so much for coming on the Pilates Elephants podcast. Thanks for having me, Raf. <laughs>